Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Today's derivatives markets, characterized by a vast array of complex OTC products, options with maturities as short as one day, and an ever-increasing pool of non-equity ETFs, bear little resemblance to those of the 1970s. In the earliest days of the listed options market, there were calls but not puts, limited expirations, and just the sprinkling of single stock underlyings. It was in this era that Robert Whaley came on the scene and made an immediate impact. Armed with a PhD in finance from the University of Toronto, Professor Whaley quickly dove into the empirical study of derivatives markets, focusing on important topics such as the valuation of American put options, how option markets anticipate quarterly earnings announcements, and the impact of program trading on the 1987 stock market crash. It was in 1993 that Professor Whaley published a paper that would fundamentally change the landscape of risk management. His Journal of Derivatives piece, Derivatives Markets on Volatility, Hedging Tools Long Overdue, described a brand new concept that sought to create a standardized metric for the cost of index options. More than 26 years later, the VIX is vastly a part of the language spoken, not just by option market participants, but by the investment community at large. Now, not merely a calculation, but a tradable asset used for both speculation and hedging, the VIX index plays an important role in how investors read market risk dynamics and seek to profit from changes in volatility. Today, Professor Whaley is the Valer Blair Potter Professor of Management and Director of the Financial Markets Research Center at the Owen Graduate School of Management at Vanderbilt University. I was honored to have the opportunity to speak with Professor Whaley and learn more about his long and successful career in academia, his wide body of financial research, and his meaningful perspective on the evolution of the VIX over the years. Please enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Robert Whaley. Professor Whaley, it is a real pleasure to have you today, and thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, James. No problem. Well, you've got a storied career in academia and specifically in, in finance, and you're known for a lot of your research in and around the derivative space. As we get started with our conversation, why don't you give us some of your thoughts on your early days? I know you have a PhD and an MBA from the University of Toronto. What is it that sparked your early interest in finance? That's sort of a fun memory for me. I actually had a very interesting visiting instructor when I was a PhD student in Toronto. And he was very much getting into options. His name was Fred Argetti. Just getting into options at the time. And he whetted my appetite for that area. He then went back to the U.S. He was just there for one year, and I had to complete my dissertation. There was no one on the faculty at the University of Toronto at the time that had any expertise in options. This was an era where Black & Scholes had just come out, CBOE had just started trading listed options, and everything was new and very exciting. I want to be part of that, but I couldn't do my dissertation on it, and... So I decided to do one on more traditional asset pricing. I think I completed it in less than a year. Everything was signed off, and then I headed to Vanderbilt in 78 and just immersed myself in everything related to options, from all the theoretical papers by Black and Scholes and Bob Merton to what was going on 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 the CBOE at the time. started very early on to make friends there, and I've had a long-standing relationship with them in a variety of different capacities. But the beauty of finance research is you can take theoretical ideas and then put them to the test immediately. These markets trade, and many of the markets have idiosyncrasies that affect pricing in pretty important ways. So it's sort of that the theory side and then empirical side go hand in hand. And I've had a lot of fun over more than four decades now just exploring the derivatives area. 
Well, you were completing your PhD in a period shortly after, as you noted, that the SIBO was created in 73 and they launched listed options. My understanding is those were call options and it wasn't until 1977 when put options were were listed. And then it was 1983, you had index options, S&P and OEX. What were those early days like in terms of some of the types of research that was done? You're making the point that you can test these things because you can observe market prices. What kinds of areas of empirical investigation were folks doing back in, let's say, the late 70s and early 80s with with respect to option prices? Um, I mean, you've raised an interesting point. The call options were introduced introduced in April of 73. I think there were 16 names, and they were traded on the in a smoker's lounge in the Board of Trade, as I recollect. (laughs) But it's interesting, you couldn't do much on pricing back in those days. I mean, one of the first areas to be examined was put call parity, and without a put option market, you can't very well assume put call parity and conversion reverse conversion arbitrage, which is one of the first empirical areas to be investigated. Yet at the time, I remember Joe Sullivan was uh, not willing to take a a put option proposal to the SEC because he had received legal advice that they wouldn't approve it. (laughs) And he wanted the stock options listed, and so he just went with that. But yes, your early empirical work was on put call parity. The first piece that appeared, I think, was by Hans Stoll in Journal of Finance in 1969, that was before the listed option markets he used over the counter prices, but there were a handful of studies early on by Kunkowski. I believe Dan Galai did one, essentially looking at whether put call parity worked. And when I think about it, I really have to laugh because for anyone who trades options these days, put call parity is immensely halted. Immensely obvious idea. Um, it's driven by pure arbitrage, just a costless arbitrage. And to think somebody bothered to see if prices obeyed that particular relationship is silly because people on the exchange floor were making money and over investing units. <laughs> right, right. Like any violations of what called parity was simply because you had poor prices or prices that weren't simultaneous. Again, again, it's an example of a situation where academics need to be informed about how markets are actually operating and not carrying on their research in a vacuum, not understanding fully how prices are generated and exactly what the prices are that they're using in these tests. Let's go back to Black Scholes' model itself, and I'd love for you to share some of your thoughts as you started to engage with this framework and this kind of no arbitrage framework and the assumption of normal distributions of stock prices and so forth. What, as you first saw the model and learned its underpinnings, what was that like for you? What were your kind of early impressions of the Black-Scholes model? And, And I guess, of course, Merton extended it as well. And what was the sort of impact to the community of folks doing research in and around option strategies at the time? It was a powerful, powerful impact, and I just can't overstate the importance that it it, it has had. Most financial securities of various sorts can be viewed as options, and so understanding the mechanics of option valuation is critical in understanding security valuation. Um, one of the things that Merton Schultz for, showed, for example, was that you can view the stock in a company as being an option on the value of the firm, um, with the exercise price being the face value of the debt. Well, that's incredibly insightful in the sense that it shows that managers are often interested in taking on risky projects because we all know that the call option pricing formula, the price varies directly with the volatility. So managers have an incentive to generate volatility because that drives the value of the equity of it. 
But there are all sorts of fun insights like that. Um, I'm just using a corporate application because that was the one that he used after developing his theoretical framework in his Bell Journal article. But if you even look at it, Black and Scholes, part of that paper is on corporate applications where they're simply viewing equity as a call option. Um, there are a host of other applications like that, and it, 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 what these models did is provide a framework by which people could better develop their intuition uh, or the economics around various finance problems. And of course, the model, it's a solution based on a set of assumptions, which in financial research, there's always the need to make assumptions. There is, at least in the empirical side of markets, sometimes disagreement around Black-Scholes in terms of the the validity of the assumption of the normal distribution, which my take is it's a pretty good shorthand, and we'll get into this throughout our conversation, but time and again, we see the the fat tail of markets, specifically the fat left tail. And some folks argue that this assumption of normal distributions is in some ways, while it's it does make the world a simpler, markets a simpler thing to analyze, it also has got a, a degree of a danger associated with it because we, we almost get seduced by the power of the model. As you, throughout your entire career and having seen things like the 87 crash and the great financial crisis, what's your big picture take on that and just this this notion that stock returns are are normally distributed. What does that mean to you in the context of derivatives? Right. You you raise an interesting issue, and this is one that might get into disagreements of people about all the time. I'm fully aware that Black and Scholes assumes a log normal price distribution, which means that the log of returns is normally distributed, and there are no fat tails associated with it. Historically, if you look at the distribution of stock prices, and Palma did some of this work early on, and this goes back to the early 60s, if you take the history of prices, you can see stock returns have fat tails. They're not skewed. They simply have fat tails, and you you get some chance of a high return on either side. But empirically, the distribution is symmetric, but with fat tails. What that would translate into, if you use Black-Scholes, is a volatility smile. And so if you looked at the relationship between implied volatility and exercise price or option moneyness, it would be a smile. And that's simply because the Black-Scholes model is underpricing out of the money and in the money options it's undervaluing them, so the volatility parameter has to go up. The volatility parameter that you're estimating or implying has to go up to accommodate the observed price. And so that all makes sense to me. And this this was really the state of affairs going into the October 87 crash. So let's talk about the crash a little bit. I mean, what, what you had was a situation where people were dynamically insuring stock portfolios, the Leland O'Brien Rubenstein stuff, and they were just simply readjusting their equity slash bond positions to mimic the behavior of an insured stock portfolio. And that didn't work so well because the trading strategy was dynamic. Towards the end of that particular regime, they were using the futures to get in and out of equities, which made it more efficient. But you remember that in October 87, the S&P 500 futures contract became delinked from the stock market, and the stock market wasn't even trading. So the whole system of portfolio insurance, dynamic portfolio insurance, failed at that point in time, and people who were supposed to not lose any money or lose 1% for the option premium lost upwards of 10 and 15 percent. What you saw in the days surrounding that is people rushed over and bought index puts. 
listed index puts. They hadn't been doing that in great numbers beforehand, but they were looking for a substitute for this dynamic portfolio insurance, and the index puts became that, that substitute. Demand went way up, and what you saw in the implied volatility smile, it was no longer a smile. If you get a situation where implied volatilities for the puts, out of the money puts, were extremely high, and for calls, they weren't. And so it went from a smile to a sneer or a smirk or whatever you want to characterize it as, simply because of this demand for portfolio insurance. That is not to say that the distribution of stock returns changed. It is to say that people are paying too much for portfolio insurance and they don't care. <laughs> and so they're willing to bid them up. Market makers on the other side, selling the put options are obliged to be there, but they're not obliged to sell at the Black Scholes price. They can sell at any price they want to. As they take on these positions for put options, they are put themselves in a risky position that's hard to manage from a risk standpoint. And so their only way of compensating for that is by charging higher and higher premiums. But if you look at those prices, I mean, what my work has shown, among other things, is that put option prices are higher than their actuarial values. That is what their values are expected to be if you just look at the empirical distribution of stock returns. So, yeah, I mean, I agree that you see that particular pattern in the data, but I, I think that pattern of implied volatilities is more driven by implied uh, the, the demands for portfolio insurance, and I would characterize them as being irrational <laughs> to some degree. And so that's what you're seeing. It's not any fundamental change in empirical return distribution. So you had this great crash, one day event and a reasonably quick recovery. And I think as you note, the it seems like the Leland O'Brien Rubenstein, the strategy was in some ways bigger than the market could bear. And it almost steered the market lower just by trying to stuff through so much volume on the futures hedging side in one day. What was the, so the impact on volatility curves, the surface was this skew as you call it a smirk, how did that impact your research in the in the years thereafter? What was the impact to you specifically from the the realization of the crash and then the change in option market dynamics? Did that give you new things to look at, new ideas uh, to focus on? It, it, it sure did. I mean, it, what was happening in the theoretical literature in option pricing is that people were trying to develop new theoretical models based upon more elaborate distributional assumptions for the underlying asset. So in place of a log normal distribution of returns, they tried to price it with all sorts of distributions that had different properties with respect to skewness and kurtosis and all of those sorts of things. Well, that's all well and fine, but and you might get an elegant solution, but you can't what I call parameterize it. I mean, it had so many. I mean, in Black and Scholes, you have one parameter that you have to estimate. Everything else in that formula is a known number. Or you can observe it. It's either a contract term or it's a risk-free rate or it's an observable index level. The only thing you really don't know is volatility. You only have, in essence, one degree of freedom. When you're going about using these more elaborate theoretical models, what you have to do is imply multiple parameters. The data is not rich enough to do that. You're going to have to have prices that are accurate to five decimal places in order to back out all of these parameters. It's no problem backing out one, this catch-all implied volatility, but you can't back out all of those other parameters. 
Okay, so when you use the model, your usual way of doing that is by implying these parameters. Well, it simply doesn't work. You get corner solutions when you estimate the problem and you get nonsense results. Your other approach to getting those parameters is to use a, a history of data, but you would need essentially hundreds of years of data in order to comfortably estimate the parameters of these more elaborate stochastic volatility models. And one thing that you and I both know is that markets are not stationary over 90 days, let alone 100 years. And so that's a futile exercise, trying to use histories of stock index levels to try and characterize this more elaborate distributional assumption. So that area was just more elaborate theoretical models based upon more complex distributions. I sort of took a different tact on all of this and I said, well, let's understand the markets better. Let's understand what's motivating these people to trade options. Let's understand why people would pay too much for portfolio insurance. And in part, it's simply behavioral. People were scared to death with the market crash, and they ran over to the listed index put option market. Periodically, you see those crashes, and periodically, you see the rush for options, put options in particular. But on average, in a given day, what you're seeing is put options trading, or the open interest of put options being twice that of call options. This is an insurance market, the index option market. It's not anything but that. Um, so, I mean, it was really at that point in time that I, I sort of went away from more elaborate theory to get at the issue and focused more on understanding markets and the people that influence prices and how uh, something as simple as black shows can be paired with an understanding of markets to develop strategies. And I think that's where your specific academic career and the way in which it overlaps with, with markets themselves is quite unique. Tell us about the early days of collaboration and thought process around creating this, this volatility index. What was that like? And I've got your paper in front of me here. Fall 1993, Journal of Derivatives, entitled <laughs> Derivatives on Market Volatility, Hedging Tools Long Overdue. I remember being in business school in 1994, first seeing this. So take us back to that period when you had this notion, and what did you set out to do? Well, I mean, it, I had a variety of different motivations for doing it, but by way of background, I had been working with the CBOE in a different capacity, that focused on volatility and in essence, I was focused on helping them with a class action suit against them where there was a class that of people that thought they were paying too much for put options during the October, say, October 87 crash. I thought it was kind of a silly notion. You do have to get people to sell those options, but um, in any case, we worked together on that. I, I was their litigation support person, and I became impressed with, with them as an exchange, and I guess they appreciated my work. In our discussions, I happened to mention the need for a volatility index, and they had even thought about it. I think the first person that I've seen along these lines was a guy named Gary Gastineau, he had in mind a few years earlier making a volatility index out of averaging a number of stock option implied volatilities. In any case, what we had at that point in time is the CBOE having these markets on S&P options. And um, so they had the source of data and you wouldn't have to average across different individual stocks here. These options are traded on an index. And so you could get a clean measure of implied volatility for index options. You have to be careful to keep 
the volatility index constant. I mean, you, we were talking a little bit earlier about the volatility smile. Well, you don't want volatility moving because the options you're using to compute the index are getting more in the money or out of the money and the index is getting higher. So you have to maintain a constant option money miss and this thing is at the money and you need to maintain a constant maturity. And in recommending that particular format, what you're doing is creating a series that can have a variety of purposes, one of which that was your interest was, was in having a number other than a stock price index that would be their index and would be disseminated on a real-time basis. Well, they've been paid back in spades on that one. Um, you see in the corner of your financial news reporting service, the VIX popping up every minute or so Yes, as a barometer of investor fear. The other was eventually they had in mind creating derivatives contracts. They have to have an economic motivation and creating contracts written on this new index would be a wonderful thing to have in the sense that you can easily delta hedge things if you have options in your portfolio in, in various forms, but you have no way of hedging the Vega component of it. And so what you see through the VIX futures and the VIX options is an ability to hedge those components too. And so that was a long ways off as it turns out. I mean, plans were to get VIX options and VIX futures going much earlier than 2004 and 2006, I think the futures and then the options appeared. That was simply the product development committee and the interactions with the SEC. This is an entirely new idea and new ideas are sometimes hard to sell with regulatory authorities. But they got through, and then I think the trading volume speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah, the rest is truly history when it comes to the VIX and all the products built around it. And I want to get a lot of your thoughts on, on that. And before that, though, I'm looking at some of your accomplishments here. And one of them is not just the VIX index, but its tech market cousin, the VXN which was established with your help in 2000 amidst the epic tech bubble. And as you talk about the smile and the smirk and so forth, I'm curious to get some of your views on, on the tech stock era from, you know, call it 97 to, I guess it ultimately unwound in, in and around 2001 or 2002. But that era was so unique in that you had very, very forceful up moves in stocks, perhaps even more forceful than the down moves, at least in the early days. So typically most of the volatility, let's say in the S&P is generated from the down moves, but at least in that period for tech stocks, these up moves were gigantic as well. Did you spend any time looking at the sort of differences between tech vol and old economy S&P volatility from that period? I sure did, and I can't remember. I don't think I ever published anything on it, but yes, when I created uh, the VXN, I had the historical series on that, and I had the historical series on VIX, and I played around with that stuff for months on end. Um, you can see all sorts of interesting patterns. The one that really stands out in my mind, and you're probably familiar with it, but during that area, toward that era, towards the end of that era, you had a very unusual thing happen. And that unusual thing, you, you just a minute ago talked about the inverse relationship between volatility and the stock market. The stock market was up, the goes down. That did not happen, in fact. You saw the reverse for a long period of time. The tech stocks were pumping upward, NASDAQ was going up, and VXN and VIX were both going up too. <laughs> and so you had a situation where, yes, the, the, the tech stocks were gaining, but that wasn't lost on the people that trade the options. And there were people getting mighty fearful that something was going to happen because implied volatilities were going up at the same time the stock market was going up, which is 
the antithesis of what you normally observe. Right, and my own uh, observation is that the occurrence of that, the common movements both up in an asset price and its implied volatility are typically associated with some frenzy. You know, what comes to mind is, of course, the tech bubble, oil in 2008 before everything crashed. Gold has had that kind of movement, and currently the poster child seems to be Bitcoin. So these things tend not to end well, but certainly uh, would be next to impossible to try to call the top and short it. Pretty, pretty dangerous. Let's talk about the founding of, of the tradable VIX product. So in 2004, the SIBO launched the Chicago Futures Exchange and with it launched VIX Futures. And tell me if I've got this exactly right, but at that time, there was a reformulation in some way or a recalibration of the of the VIX where from your incorporation of, I think, eight different strikes at the money, mostly, there was this goal of trying to bring in the entirety of the volatility surface. So the calculation got immensely more complicated. I was always a big part of the variance swap market, the OTC product, and I know the SIBO was trying to in some ways replicate that calculation. What's your take on the reformulation? What's your re- recollection of that process that the SIBO pursued? It was, uh, there are a variety of different things. Are there uh, at least two things that are important here? One issue that doesn't get discussed and should be discussed is the issue of market integrity and by that, what I mean is tradable projects on the VIX or tradable products on the VIX as I formulated it would have been dangerous because you have so few options going into the generation of the number. And the number is what the VIX options and the VIX futures depend upon. So what you, what happens is there is a susceptibility that the index can be manipulated and um, you want to avoid that at all costs. As it turns out, subsequently, the at the money options that went into the indexes that formulated are incredibly active and no one could possibly manipulate the at the money options in the S&P market, at least in my judgment. And so that issue uh, isn't as big as I thought it might be. But that is is clearly a part of the motivation into going to all of the other the money options, the calls and the puts on the S&P 500 index. Um, Whether you should go out that far in the tails is something that, that I might disagree about because there's no liquidity in those tails and it's really not adding information about expected future volatility. It's the, the prices are lying around and then deep out of the money options, the prices are affected pretty dramatically by the size of the bid ask spread. One of the things you had revert, referred to is the nature of the implied volatility smile or the skew. But if you did an implied volatility curve based upon all ask prices and then one based upon all bid prices and looked at that, what you find is the difference between the bid and ask VIX or volat- implied volatilities is very, very small. When you get out in the tails, it's huge. So the volatility difference can be four or 500 basis points. Is that really giving you some information? Why is it four or 500 basis points? Because the theoretical value is a penny and a half, or let's say six and a half cents, and the bid ask spread is five, a nickel to 10, a dime. And trade prices tend to be discreet like that. So, The question is how many options should be included, but you don't want the index to be in a position where people can influence it in any way. And that's been true of any cash settled contract since uh, the Euro dollar futures contracts were introduced in 1982. 
you make a great point about which options to include, and I'm, I'm remembering back to some of the days of trading variant swaps, and there were, in my recollection, there were dealers that placed a greater value on the tail. So as they sought to theoretically replicate this this variant swap, in the theory, requires an, an infinite number of strikes, all of which are tradable, and as you say, they're not. And so at some point, you cut it off, and then the question is where. And at least in the early days of variant swaps, we found that there were some meaningful differences in terms of where dealers were pricing variant swaps. And I think it was a function of where you basically cut the tail off in terms of what you incorporated into the strip. So it's an important point. Uh, I mean, you raise another important important point, too, and that has to do with, again, there's this fascination with, with trying to get theory to drive things in almost an anal fashion. But the theory guiding this was actually in a paper by Breeden and Litzenberger in 1987 to get a correct volatility estimate from that approach, you need an infinite number of exercise prices between zero and positive infinity. <laughs> <laughs> you do, I mean, every infinitesimal. Right. And you simply don't have that. You don't have that in any market. And as soon as you start to, S&P is the best example we have. They have a, a wide range of exercise prices. You need that to be as wide as possible because you're wanting infinity. But I've seen people use this VIX formula for things like gold and crude oil, where you might have four or five different strikes trading actively, and you get absolutely nonsensical results. It's a great point. And in and around when VIX futures were launched, the street started trading. It was probably a little earlier than this, more like maybe 2002 or so we started trading single stock variant swaps. And you can imagine the the shortage of strikes that really presented a pretty big problem. The, the street tried anyway, but it was very easy to come up with vastly different theoretical values for the single stock variant swap because of the shortage of strikes and how you valued the tails. So it's, it's a great point. So VIX options launched in 2006. And then Critically, in 2009, the VXX was launched. And so this is, at least in my opinion, a pretty harmless trading strategy that just rolls VIX futures on a daily basis, tries to keep some semblance of a constant maturity. But the statistics on the performance of this thing since inception are uh, heartbreaking. If I put a million dollars into this as a hedge, in 2009, I would have $2,000 left. And the annualized return is negative 55% per year since inception. So these are remarkably negative strategies and hedging should cost money. But boy, that's a tough ticket to own on a consistent basis. You were talking about the vol risk premium before. Share your thoughts. I've given you some, some stats that certainly don't play into the folks that are advocating for hedging, that those sound expensive. What are your thoughts on on the performance of something like the VXX? Oh, <laughs> you don't really have to think about that one. <laughs> A minus 99 or 0.99% rate of return. <laughs> I think everyone could come up with the same conclusion there. But the issue, I, mean, I have two issues with respect to these products. And VXX addresses one of them. And the other is if you look at TVIX or the ill-fated XIV, that addresses another. Levered and inverse products are a serious issue. And But returning to VXX, I uh, actually wrote a paper on this, I think it was 2013, um, I started to look at these products, and VXX is really not written on VIX. And I think when it started trading in 2009, there was the impression that if you're going to trade this exchange-traded note, you'd be trading the VIX. Well, the two are different animals. 
And VX6 has a beta of, I think, 0.5 relative to VIX. So it's only about half the risk. And it's half the risk in terms of volatility, um, which is fine. It's highly correlated with, the two are highly correlated, which is, which is good in terms of hedging purposes. But what I failed to see initially is, is the expected rate of return. And in, when you buy insurance, insurance is a negative expected rate of return asset, but I hadn't realized how negative the expected negative or rate of return was on these products. And so I got into looking at this and wondered what was driving this particular behavior. And it didn't take long before I figured out what was going on. I don't think many people know what's going on. You have a market that futures market that is generally in contango. And so the futures price curve is strongly upward sloping. And what you have underlying VIX is a VIX futures index. It's not VIX, but a futures index that has is 30 days out. Um, you keep a constant 30-day futures, essentially. It's the price of a constant 30-day futures. And in S&P, Standard & Poor's computes this index. And what happens from day to day, given the futures prices are sloped upward, what happens from day to day is you're selling selling the nearby at a lower price than you're buying the second nearby. And so you're losing that much money each day as they maintain this 30 day to maturity. And this behavior goes on and on and on and that's what you saw, or that, that is what's driving the behavior that you mentioned. It's just this contango effect. And this contango effect it's been observed in other markets. Crude oil, it often happens, for example, because airlines use crude oil futures to hedge their fuel costs. And so they buy heavily in the short maturities, driving the price of the futures upward. And so if you think, it, look at products like USO, the ETF, it too goes down, it tends to go down in value for the same reason. But that notion is hard for people to understand. I mean, for you and me, it's less hard because we've seen the literature through time. But these products are aimed at retail customers. They're not institutional products to my mind. It doesn't make a lot of sense because institutions can trade futures and they can trade options. And so they can create the exposures. What VXX does is it provides mom and pop, if you like, the ability to trade volatility if they want to so gamble. Right. Um, it's a substitute for going to Las Vegas. So they can bet on these things, volatility going up and down. They don't want to consider it as an asset for the pension fund because of the rate of return. Although it has great correlation properties for diversification, the rate of return it's just going to bury your portfolio. So you don't want to be doing, you don't want to be doing that. And so it's not a buy and hold asset. It's purely a speculative asset. And so what has been created is a market where you want to play with intraday predictions on market volatility. That's it. You don't want to hold it. You just want to get in and out, you, in you, and out. You mentioned the contango shape of the, Vol curve, which has been a a constancy for years now, and you also mentioned its impact on the VXX. I'm wondering if you can step back and if you have some thoughts on the shape of the curve and why the curve is shaped that way. Is it the product itself that might be playing a role? I'd seen in some of your research that you had investigated the supply and demand of optionality and how it was linked back to implied volatility. Why is it the case in your view that the VIX being a very short-term measure so typically clears the market lower than, let's say, two to six-month implied volatility? Well, I mean, if you, again, I, I, I can't say definitively about what's happening, but I mean, let's, let's just use some common sense. 
I mean, what you have is this product. In order to create this product, what you have to do is have a futures position that, um, suppose right now there are two futures contracts. The one has 15 days to maturity of X futures and one has 45. You need a 30 day, a constant 30 day volatility. So you, you put 50% in each futures contract. And so that's what VXX is on a given day. Uh, it's created using these futures contracts, or ultimately it is. That's what the benchmark is created for. It. VIX follows that benchmark. So if we go one day, now your short-term contract is 14 days, and your long-term contract is 44 days. You have to take money out of the 15 or 14 day, the shorter term contract, and put it in a longer term contract to maintain 30 days. Well, you're selling at a higher price than you're buying. It's causing causing the loss. But you talked about the futures price curve. Now, let's think about what we're doing. Our demand is to sell the short term, pushing prices down, and the demand is to buy the second nearby contract that pushes price up. So what you're doing is you're twisting the yield curve or you're promoting a positive slope. You're promoting a positive slope in the VIX term structure through the very existence of VXX. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. The the Euro stocks, I know they've had their V2X. I think they stopped trading options on the V2X. I think the future still exists. There is a VXX-like structure that uses V2X futures, but it's vastly illiquid. But I'd taken a look at one point at just the roll down of the Euro stocks, SX5E. That's the S&P of, of Europe. Remarkably less roll down. So the curve was had a little bit of slope to it, but nowhere near as much slope as as the S&P. And that's always been an open question, at least for me personally, is the product itself playing a role in the shape of the curve? And is it almost a self-reinforcing, self-fulfilling process? And that kind of leads me to the next area, which is we we noted that people blew up owning VXX, which is long vol. And what did we see in the first quarter of 2018? They blew up on the opposite trade too on the XIV. And the setup going into February of 2018 was this unbelievable amount of success for the XIV and the other one, SVXY. They had just been printing money for people and they got bigger and bigger. Share with us your thoughts on that whole debacle. (laughs) And it was a debacle. And it's funny because in, in the teaching of my class, one of my classes I teach I focus on ETFs and our ETPs and spend a little more time on the volatility ones. But I come across as fairly negative on levered and inverse products. And the reason that I am is is simply because people don't understand what's going on. The mechanics, they're promising one or minus one or two times the daily return. So if you hold them for any length of time, people expect to get two times the return on the index. But they don't because of a compounding issue and volatility issues. In any case, this is the inverse product, and I agree with you entirely. People made it was printing money during 2017. XIV was, was just going through the roof, and people, people thought it was just a cash machine. But something spooked the market in February 2018, uh, early on, on second, I think it was a Friday, uh, Monday this happened. Um, but what you have, one of the hedging demands of these levered products is at the end of the day, the issuer must buy or sell VIX futures contracts to relever for the following day. And so if the market has gone up on this Friday, at the end of Friday, what they have to do is buy a bunch of VIX futures to make sure they can give two times the leverage on Monday. 
And if it's an inverse product and the market has gone up, they also have to buy the futures at the end of the day Friday to protect the minus one leverage for Monday. They think it goes in the same direction for positive leverage funds and inverse funds, the hedging and I can show that. And so what you have, and this happens every day, if there's been a big move in volatility, either up or down, there's a, a whole bunch of hedging had to go, has to go on at the end of the day. It has to be at the settlement price. And indeed, that's why they created, I don't know if you know about the task futures market, but that's helping out issuers trying to trade at settlement. Yes. So there's all of this demand that happens as a result of these levered products. And it was a recipe waiting to happen. I mean, I was been predicting for four years one of these leveraged products would blow up. And I looked pretty good on February 5th, <laughs> 2018, right. because it did blow up, but it's sensitive to volatility and the volatility of volatility is probably the highest. Bitcoin is, once I get leveraged products on Bitcoin, <laughs> that'll blow up too. But that was it. I mean, the structure of these levered products demands all of this trading at the very end of the day. And the amount of trading that was demanded, it's an example I use in class. I show them how much was being demanded by the one product alone. And the demand for trades at 3.15 Chicago time, that volume surpassed the open interest that existed on February 2nd. So I can't think of another situation in my history of studying futures markets where the demand to trade in an active market was double the open interest mm. that existed for those products. No market is ready to handle that. One of the areas of research among the many that you've spent your career on is in contract specification and contract design. And even as I review our conversation, we've talked about the 87 crash. We didn't really talk about long-term capital, but these market blowups seem to always come with some leverage, you know, some faulty assumption, but always amplified by leverage. And there seems to be some form of violation of one of those Black-Scholes assumption, which is markets are infinitely liquid. And I'm curious, as you kind of survey the world of ETPs and this vast universe of exchange-traded product, and other types of financial products. Are there products out there that bear some similarity to that XIV risk, or was that super unique in your estimation? No, the formula that you would use for computing the leverage adjustment demand that occurs exactly at settlement is the same for all all of the different levered and inverse products. If it's a it's an ETF, a levered ETF on the S&P 500. The same thing exists, except that the S&P 500 futures market is a whole lot more, more liquid. And in that particular market, I don't know the degree to which they use futures contracts. They, they're replicating things um, using stocks. But in order to get the leverage cheaply, Generally, swaps or futures are used. And when you get a big market move, the demand is not known until the very end of the day. And so what you have is a demand that really builds on the demand that existed during the day. And so market goes up by 10%. You have all these people that want to buy at the close. They drive the prices up. But if they drive their prices up, the index goes up and they have to buy more. So it's called a positive feedback loop. Right. And it's inherently unstable. And, but they, I mean, it, it exists. And so it, it depends on the movement during the day. And the movement during the day is guided by, not guided, the direction isn't guided by, but you get some sort of friends sense for how bad the move can be or how detrimental 
by looking at the volatility of the underlying commodity. So if you go through your list of commodities and it sounds like you've traded gold or oil, those are highly volatile. But if you go to something like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is worse than VIX volatility. Its volatility is enormous. And so I don't think ETPs have been approved just yet, but they're around the corner. And then around the corner from that are going to be leverage products. So, yes, you're going to see this again. And, yes, I agree with you. In the case of long-term capital management, you had a situation where they found that they could find these mispricings. And they weren't huge mispricings. They were like nickel here and a nickel there. Well, how are you going to make a lot of money by getting a nickel at a time, vacuuming up these nickels? Well, you lever yourself up so you can vacuum up more nickels in. And the more you lever up, the more risk you take on relative to the reward. And just bam, you can have an Asian Asian financial crisis or Russian debt default and blow up everything in your face. And that's what happened. And that's really the story that exists. People get greedy. They see something working. And this goes back to who is that guy in? Tax assessor in California. Yeah, Robert Citron. Citron. I mean, that's the same, same greed, levering up. He had three times leverage. He was a guy managing taxes. Yes. And spending it on building bridges and stuff. So, I mean, his, his duration should have been a month, two months of, of the instrument he was holding because there's a constant outflow of money. Instead, He's got duration of five and six and seven long-term bonds. Then he levers himself up. He worked in the past. Therefore, it's going to continue to work in the future? (laughs) Question mark. (laughs) Right. I mean, the the, the same thing happens again and again. I don't know what you can do to put in a safeguard because the whole thing about financial innovation is it's to get around regulations. Yeah, there seems to be uh, a commonality of investors underestimating how quickly liquidity can evaporate. I think that's what these cycles tend to, to teach us. And I think in current markets, that seems to be a risk that I feel like people are pointing to. And, and I myself believe very much that we'll ultimately learn that liquidity can kind of come and go in an instant. And we tend, uh, especially during these long and safe cycles, to to overestimate its staying power. That it can it can quickly quickly evaporate. You're exactly right, and that's one thing that academics need to have a better appreciation of. It's not the case that you can go out there and demand as much as you want without affecting price. It's just nonsense. If you tried to sell that idea to your grandmother, she wouldn't believe you. <laughs> well, why in the world should you try and sell that to your colleagues? Large trades are going to affect price, and you better understand who's going to be on the other side of that trade. And if he decides to take his capital away from that market-making activity, you're just hanging there in the wind. <laughs> it's, it's such a great point. As we finish up, I'm curious, with regard to your current interests? What are you focusing on? Are there any specific aspects of products or market risk that have got you especially excited that you're looking into? Well, a fun one, and I alluded to it just a little bit earlier, is was this task market, traded settlement market. And I, I recognize what traded settlement was introduced for. I think it was actually ICE that introduced it many years ago and it had to do with products in two different markets, crude oil trades on ice and crude oil trades on NYMEX as part of CME. And if you had a spread between them and wanted to unwind the spread, you would have to do orders in both markets and face the execution risk. And so they introduced these traded settlement orders so people who are doing spreads can exit their position in a more orderly fashion without any introducing the execution risk. But there was this demand by issuers in the VIX market, VIX futures market, 
they need to trade at settlement because the products are benchmarked to the settlement prices of the futures contracts. And so they need to trade at settlement. And so issuers beforehand were incurring execution risk because they have to buy or sell in great quantities at the settlement price, but they can't do that in the trading of prices leading up to settlement as a proxy for it. So that back in 2011, I think it was November, the CBOE introduced at issuer's request this task market. So these issuers can go in and say, well, I know my demand, they can do it up to 313 each day. I'm, my demand is going to be 5,000 contracts at settlement. So they place that order. And so that person is standing on the other side is selling that order if it's a buy, and he has to deliver 5,000 contracts at the settlement price. Well, what's that guy going to do, the person standing on the other side? Well, he has to go buy the futures contract in order to hedge his position, but in buying the futures contract, he's driving up the settlement price. So he buys at this range of prices below settlement, and then he sells at settlement. It's a great device for the issuers. They can deliver exactly what they're promising in their perspective. The settlement returns, there would be no erosion other than the expense ratio, which includes the management fee. That's the only erosion. And so their risk is way down. VIX futures trading goes way up because you have another market for VIX futures. But is this really helping investors in any way? I guess to some extent it is because they're getting the benchmark returns they were promised. They're ignoring the fact that the index return reverses as a result of all of this buying demand or selling demand at the end of the day. So looking at this task market and its operation is just fascinating to me. Spreads in the task futures are one-fifth of what the spreads are in the VIX futures themselves, which is stunning. But all that indicates to me is it's very profitable to make market stand on the other side of the issuer's demands each day. I think there's an enormous amount of volume, an ever-increasing amount of volume that's occurring in the last half an hour and even less of each trading day. It all gets jammed right to the close. And it's an interesting area of, of investigation because if things are tied to a closing price, all the action, and you can argue that a disproportionate amount of the volatility is going to occur right there as well. Yep. You're spot on. Well, Professor Whaley, this has been a really great conversation. I was so thankful that I was able to reach out to you and just get your take on markets and your storied career in academic research, and of course, specifically the VIX index, which continues to be traded in lots and lots of different ways, that's for sure. And it was as early as 2000, and, or as recently as 2017, where they were listing, boy, I think they might've gotten as low as the eight and a half strike during uh, that vol meltdown. And then we got as high as 30, odd strikes late last year and, and early last year. So yep. uh, amazing uh, volatility of volatility, I, I suppose. Yep. Well, thanks again for taking the time and we'll talk again real soon. All right. Take care. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alpha